So without any further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about today's speakers before um, they take the stage. So our moderator for this evening is Anne Pellegrini, a professor of performance studies and social and cultural analysis at New York University, where she is also an affiliate faculty member for the program in religious studies. Her books include Love the Sin, Sexual Regulation and the Limits of Religious Tolerance, co-authored with Janet Jacobson, and also for sale in our bookshop this evening. And the coded anthologies Queer Theory and the Jewish Question and Secularisms. Her book, You Can Tell Just by Looking and 20 Other Myths About LGBT Life and People, co authored with Michael Broski and Michael Amico, was a finalist for the 2014 Lambda Literary Award for Best LGBT Nonfiction. She enjoys psychoanalysis and show tunes and is a candidate in adult psychoanalysis at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research in New York City. Uh, Malcolm Shanks is an organizer and educator. Uh, they serve on the steering committee for the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity, a collective founded in 2013 to support and uh, build power for transgender, gay, lesbian, bisexual, intersex, and queer Muslims. Malcolm creates workshops, trainings, and other learning moments that build radical knowledge in decolonial movements. They currently work as a lead trainer at Race Forward, where they provide training, coaching, and consulting for building racial equity practices at organizations. They're also co-creator of the zine project, Decolonizing Gender, a curriculum. Uh, I should mention that one of tonight's participants, Eli, uh, sorry, Adam Eli Werner, is not available to join us tonight because he's protesting the Supreme Court decision of the Muslim ban in Foley Square. So he regrets not joining us, but sense his sense of community. Uh, and um, uh, also joining the conversation, however, is Reverend Dr. Paula Williams, a pastor of preaching and worship at Left Hand Church in Longmont, Colorado. She's also the president of R <coughs> RLT Pathways, Incorporated, a nonprofit providing counseling and coaching services. Paula serves on the board of the Q Christian Fellowship, the Union of Affirming Christians, and the Open Network of Progressive Churches. As a transgender pastor, Paula has been featured in the New York Times, the Denver Post, Colorado Public Radio, the Huffington Post, and TEDx Mile High. Please join me in greeting our speakers tonight. What a pleasure to see all of you here this evening um, on a day of such um, momentous decisions coming to us from Washington, D.C. Um, and I know this uh, event was planned well before the decisions in Masterpiece Cake Shop and then today's decision, Hawaii versus Trump. And, um, but it, there's something poignantly timely about gathering here today to talk about, talk at the intersections of religious and sexual identities and uh, the intersections also of religious freedom and sexual freedom, especially at a moment when these seem to be posed as oppositional, as impossible to reconcile. I suspect we'll be talking a lot about those negotiations and the false binary between religion and sexuality and, and how different social justice movements can actually help us to think intersectionally in some really important and quite needed ways now. So I pre-circulated some questions and some starting points for our conversation with Malcolm and, and Paula. Um, so let's just dive in. And there'll be plenty of time also for you to be asking questions and, and talking with um, tonight's um, speakers as well. Um, so, but let's go to it. And let me know if, um, if there's any problem hearing with the mic. All right, so um, to speak of a queer and religion connection might seem to some LGBTQ people and allies um, counterintuitive and even impossible at this particular historical moment in this country at a time when public conversations about religion and sexuality again try to tend to present them as oppositional and tend also to align religion with the most conservative versions of it and particularly with conservative versions of Christianity in this country. Um, and, and this posing of religion as against LGBTQ life and equality is one that, again, I think it'd be worth thinking about seriously and perhaps challenging. So I was hoping we could begin by asking Malcolm Apollo to uh, talk a little bit about this way of dividing up religion versus sexual and gender diversities. And, and also in thinking, particularly about today's court decision, religion 
as also against different kinds of racial and national diversities too, as we see with the travel ban. Well, I think one of the things we find is that um, I do a lot of work with PFLAG nationally, parents and families of lesbians and gays, and, and their national leadership uh, is relatively tone deaf to how much of our constituents, how many of our constituents actually have a religious background. Mm -hmm. So 52% of the LGBTQ population in the United States identify with a specific religion, 48% identify as Christian, and that's up from 42% in 2007, most recent statistics, 2015. So you are dealing with a more than average population that does identify with a very specific religion. And there doesn't seem to be awareness of that, um, not at, the, at either side of that. Um, and so you, you end up with the evangelical world, which of course right now happens to be the, the media darling at the moment and have more cultural impact at the moment. Um, that world has no idea that that's the case. And of course is, is equally tone deaf um, to the fact that these folks are looking for sexual expression and for spiritual expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, I thought a lot about how to answer this question because I think there are so many ways to go at it. Um, so I think the first thing, the first thing that I say uh, always whenever I'm having this conversation is that the division between religion and sexuality comes from a like thoroughly Christian-centric um, and Western secular understanding of religion, as well as like a thoroughly Eurocentric, uh, white-centered like understanding of sexuality. Um, and those are like big Foucault, Foucault words, whatever that are in a book um, and really academic. But what I really mean is that Islam um, throughout most of its history has been thought of as a way of life that includes sexuality. Um, and that many Islamic texts and Muslim texts throughout all, like all of the history of Muslims have been about different ways to have sex. <laughs> um, not just a, and not just because it reproduces the next generation and we need more Muslims and we need more men to like pass down land to each other, but for purposes of pleasure, for pleasing partners, for pleasing oneself, for pleasing all sorts of people, right? And so Islam is not diametrically opposed to open and honest and consistent conversations about sexuality until we arrive at the point of, for example, people trying to modernize so that they could compete with other, like at that point, European imperial powers. And so at that point, modernizing means civiliz civilizing according to the European ideals of what sexuality means, which at that point where religion belongs indoors, sex belongs under your clothes and inside like the doors of your bedroom and anything else is like uncivilized, savage, the reason your economies are failing, the reason colonialism is winning, et cetera, et cetera, right? So race and gender and sexuality and religion get deeply, deeply connected throughout the like 18th, 19th, 20th centuries for a lot of places. And I'm thinking specifically of places like Persia, which when it transitioned into the uh, Republic of Iran or the Empire of Persia, like women were getting scarves ripped off of their heads, right? Because the, because the idea was that in order to modernize the nation, that they still had to control women's sexuality, right? And so one of the things that I think is also worth noting is that in many ways, like the, the division between religion and sexuality is not even that true, right? Because the state often uses both. And by the state, I mean many kinds of states where we're talking about Turkey, Iran, the United States, Great Britain, um, Brazil, right? Uses both religion and sexuality to control like women, right? And so that is a very specific thing um, that I always try to also acknowledge in that story because it it just it just creates this understanding where the dichotomy is a piece of theater that is consistently used to control the sexuality of racialized populations, and that that like consistently bears itself out mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So that's my understanding. Right. I mean, I think one of the things you just pointed to is that the relationship between what we call religion and what we call sexuality, it has varied historically. It, it varies not simply from one national context to another, but it varies historically within a given national context. And we can assume in advance that secularism is always is on the side of quote progressive sexuality and gender. Right. In some instances it is, in some instances it's not. And similarly, we can't assume that religion is on the side of conservative um, and against 
sexual and gender diversities. In some instances it is, in some instances it's not. We also want to ask which religions, which places. I mean, this is, and that kind of complexity, I mean, to go back to, you know, the uh, particular versions of evangelicalism are the media darling. Uh, the media, mainstream media, actually can't handle the complexity of religious life in this country. And so we get that there's the tendencies, and I would say that, you know, secular queer movement reproduces this. Because it says a version of, of course they hate us, they're religious. Now, conservative religious people love that because then they get to monopolize religion in the public square. So when you put a microphone in the face of someone who's religious, nine times out of ten it's going to be a really conservative religious person because the ground has already been ceded to that. I mean, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, from your own also experience sort of organizing in religious communities and, and speaking with the media. <laughs> My background is, is mostly in the evangelical world, and in the evangelical world, pretty much all of their theology, all of their perspective on things is very modern age driven. It really, it goes back to, uh, not, not even to, um, uh, to Hebraic or, or uh, you know, first century ethics. It, it goes back to John Locke and, um, and Rene Descartes. I mean, it, it's a 500 year old movement. And because of that, it's very propositionally based. It's not flesh and blood based. And so, like you talk about sexuality, for instance, I was very connected with the evangelical world at its highest levels. And the Me Too movement that is just beginning to hit the Church Too movement is going to become massive. Um, because most of those who are in ministry, and this would also be true in the Roman Catholic Church, were taught to deny their sexuality. And if you deny your sexuality, then of course you're also denying its power. And of course we all know that sexual power will in fact find its way out into expression. And so the, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg on that at this point. But when, when you're feeding the evangelical machine, you're, just, you're feeding a tribal machine. You know, you, like I think of the work of E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, um, you know, first identifying that this, the main social unit for the, for the species is not the nuclear family, but it's the tribe. And then identifying what he called the nine eusocial species, uh, E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L, eusocial species. He said those nine species have what Dawkins would call a selfish gene, but then they also have a tribal gene. And that they will sacrifice themselves for the sake of the tribe. And he says that in eight of the nine species, they'll sacrifice for themselves for the sake of the, tri uh, sake of the tribe. Um, the enemy's defeated life goes on. But unfortunately, the ninth species, he says, evolved to believe that the tribe needs an enemy for the tribe to survive. And so where it does not have one, it will create one. And so most of what you see now, certainly from the media perspective with the evangelicals, is just typical tribal behavior creating enemies that don't exist. Saying, for instance, like HB2 in North Carolina, the transgender community is a terrible threat in female uh, restrooms. Uh, without recognizing that, you know, how many actual arrests and convictions do you have? Zero. Uh, and between 1987 and 2007, you had 7,095 insurance uh, payments out for clergy who had, in fact, abused people within their congregations. Uh, one in every 24 churches in America. But this has not ever been about facts. It's about tribal behavior. And so you have a tribe now that feels threatened, uh, this tribe of superiority that feels threatened. And it has, you know, like people who want to try to, to study scripture, Hebrew scriptures or New Testament scriptures and argue from that when it comes to LGBTQ issues. That's not ever where the argument has been. This is tribes creating enemies that don't exist. Creating scapegoats within the tribe who must be driven out because it's what tribes do. It's what they've done for eons. You know, Wilson says, um, he says, we don't get a hold of that. We lose the species, we lose the planet. And that would be the hopeful part of the evening. Um, I wonder, and this, I think this is connected to maybe, because you, you've both been doing community work for a long time. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about working at this intersection between queerness and religion. Again, I think it's a counterintuitive place to be working for to a lot of people in the LGBTQ movement. Now, yes, I mean, it's so fascinating, right? 52% of people who would identify in some way with the LGBTQ community, uh, put the word community in quotes, is an impossible fantasy. Uh, it's not a monolith. But despite that, the political, or the political, let's say, imagination has still been quite secular. 
I think. I think it's fair to say. And so working at these intersections, this still has the force of a kind of surprise, I think, to a lot of people. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see working in that space, not just, not just also working, but also living at that space. I mean, what is that negotiation like? What happens when you put queerness and religion together? Uh, so as a, as a bit of context, I've worked in at this intersection in two specific places. Um, so the first is uh, working with queer and trans Muslim communities, which is what I continue to do. Um, and that uh, mostly that looks like reminding each other that we exist and gathering each other as much as possible so that we can continue to understand and remember that we exist when times are hard and we feel really isolated. Um, the second context is within the um, marriage equality and then after that the uh, large movement to fight bills like HB2 all over the country um, where we where the organization that I worked with had a specific group of people of which I was one that went around to congregations and organized religious communities and said hey you're preaching a sort of inclusive message we would love for you to take a step into uh, formal political spheres and formal political stuff. And so we were organizing, we called them uh, faith grass tops leaders, right? Leaders of congregations um, who are respected for their moral and political positions oftentimes, but haven't yet used that or formalized their sort of personal journey around sexual, sexual identity and orientation and gender identity and expression. They haven't taken that yet and stepped out through for their audience. So what we were actually doing was helping uh, mostly straight faith leaders come out about their support of queer and trans people to their congregations and then to support their congregations with coming out to their larger spiritual communities about their support as well. So those are the two contexts that I work in. Slightly very different, obviously, because the, the Muslim sphere was um, much browner and blacker on average, um, because that's just the way that it looks outside the mainstream LGBT movement in the United States. Um, so what that is, what that has often felt like is like, um, for me, uh, I have to again, like, say, right? This is this is me, a Muslim, stepping into Christian spaces. Um, so I have an outsider perspective in many in many ways. Um, but what it looked like doing doing that work specifically was um, a lot of people were really really excited to have the conversation and wanted to have the conversation so badly because actually they haven't had the structure of support for reconciling what is in essence a centuries long conversation. Right? The church has been writing about sex mm -hmm. since the church existed. Um, and so it's not as if there's a lack of words on paper. <laughs> um, what, they were, what they were searching deeply, deeply for was trainings about how to build inclusive spaces, about how to uh, not mess up, basically. There's a lot of fear that people had about um, repeating some of the same exclusions that they had learned and naturalized. Um, so that was what a lot of that experience was about with Christians. Um, with, with, with Muslims, um, what it oftentimes looked like was trying to hold the immense diversity of about like a billion people, right? <laughs> so there are so many possible sects and because there aren't that many of us in the United States in comparison to queer and trans Christians, um, it means that when we get together, we have all sorts of sects who are praying in different ways, praying at different times, do, think, thinking theologically about different things, um, and that it's actually really difficult. The, okay, so the con is that it's very difficult to push a theological position in a religious community with no centralized leadership. The pro is that it's actually pretty easy to uh, sustain theological momentum in a place with no centralized leadership. There is no one to put walls up in our way. You know, no one, there's, there's with, with, a, with a couple of exceptions, because again, it's a billion people, right? So there are, there are some sects like Shias and Ismailis, et cetera, who have certain like specific theological centers, people who set doctrine and theology. Um, but for the majority of us Sunnis, um, what our relationship is with scripture and the sunnah, the tradition, is exactly that, our relationship with it. Um, and so there is no one in effect who can, who can come and say that our interpretation is wrong, which actually provides a lot, uh, a lot more openness than Christians often experience in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
the Christian experience in the United States is uh, significantly negative if you happen to be LGBTQ. 70% of the Roman Catholic population actually are supportive of marriage equality, but it's not a democracy in the Catholic Church. Um, and, and particularly those in power uh, do not hold that at, at the bishop level in the United States. Um, You've got 66% of the mainline Protestant denominations are supportive of marriage equality, but every one of those is declining. And at the rate they're going, between 17, 22, or between 22 and 26 years, depending on whose statistics you look at, most of those denominations will be gone. This would be the Presbyterian Church of the USA, the Episcopal Church in America, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and the United Methodist Church, the United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, all of the denominations that, were, uh, that are much more uh, theologically liberal. If you take a look at the denominations that are growing, the Southern Baptists and then a lot of the independent churches, at this point most of the growing churches in America growing rapidly are independent churches, often independent megachurches. Uh, like you take a, a look at um, the rapidly growing, uh, they're not called Trinity Grace anymore, but the, the various Trinity Grace congregations in New York City that are running thousands that didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, that group isn't particularly supportive or warm. I mean, I came out of that background, and the day I came out of my blog, there were 65,000 page views, and they we're all really, really pissed. Uh, so that world is, is, they're a ways back, but very positively, even within that world, we're seeing a paradigm shift right now that is probably the most significant we've seen in the Christian world in the last 500 years. You're seeing three major areas of shift. You're seeing a move from orthodoxy to orthopraxy. So a move from religion as a system of beliefs to religion as a way of life good shift. You're also seeing a shift from God as the eternal threatener to God as the ultimate loving participant. So traditionally and certainly in evangelicalism, one of the defining uh, points of it is that we're bad, we need to be sent to hell unless someone punishes their child so that we can go to heaven. And that has been a, uh, a very major point of evangelical Christianity. And you're beginning to see the shifts away from what we call the substitutionary atonement. But a simpler way to put it, moving from God as eternal threatener to God as ultimate loving participant. Jesus coming to earth not to die for our sins, but Jesus coming to earth to show solidarity with us in our suffering. So that's a major shift. The third major shift is from the church organizing for its own protection, uh, for its own tribal welfare, to the church organizing for the common good. So if you look at the churches that are being started nowadays, focused primarily on millennials, you see that shift already taking place in evangelicalism. And you see it then show out like with LGBTQ issues, 51% of millennials are supportive of marriage equality. 51% of millennial evangelicals are supportive of marriage equality. While 36% of evangelicals are supportive of marriage equality, which is up 10 points between 2008 and 2015, just a seven, or 2007 and 15, an eight year time period. So we're seeing a shift in that world. And because that world does have such a huge impact on our culture as a whole, um, this is a positive shift. But of course, it's barely moving the needle mm -hmm. in terms of where we need to go or, or where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. So we're finding for the first time uh, you have so many people coming out of an LGBTQ background who virtually always, uh, or evangelical background who are LGBTQ, who are virtually always ostracized from their churches. Now, you will not find a megachurch in America, by the way, that will tell you that they do not accept you as a practicing LGBTQ person because they're savvy enough to know that their market is shifting. Um, so they're not gonna, they're gonna say they're completely open and affirming, but then try to get into those churches and do anything even teach children, and you'll find out you can't. There's an organization called Church Clarity that's doing amazing work, churchclarity.org, that will tell you pretty quickly whether you have a church that's going to bullshit you or whether you have a church that's actually going to tell you where they are on this. Um, as one of the mega church pa senior pastors said to me, you know, we've sh I've shifted on this, but my money hasn't. Surprise, surprise. Um, so you, when, you, when you look at that emerging population, like the church I pastor, uh, we're about 50% LGBTQ. Uh, we've got a number of churches in Denver that have uh, what I would call mainline Protestant theology, but evangelical methodology. So their style, their music is very much like you see in the big giant churches. But they are now um, fully affirming, and most of them are actually moving on 
from focus on LGBTQ issues, even possibly a little prematurely when it comes to laws and things like that, uh, to racial uh, justice issues, which of course is critical and, and important. But we're, I, I have, I'm very hopeful about the, the shift that's taking place. And I've been studying the evangelical church for a lot of decades and teaching courses on evangelical Christianity for a lot of decades. So I'm very hopeful. I mean, I think the shift is going, we're hitting a, a tipping point that I think is going to come faster than most people realize. Some people think that you'll see most evangelical churches supportive of the marriage, equal, uh, of marriage equality uh, within 25, 50 years. I think it'll happen in the next 10. I think we're just going to see a big shift. So, I mean, this picture you're presenting of this sort of these, these three shifts, um, I mean, how would you put that together with the fact that we know that, that, you know, for example, our current president has a huge base of support among evangelical leaders, but also, you know, sort of communities. This isn't just evangelical leaders and the, the flocks are going in another direction. So is this a contradiction? Is this that, you know, the shifts you're talking about haven't caught up to where actually living communities are right now? I think it's generational. And I think you see those people losing their power. And so when you know, the, the last gasp for power tends to be quite ugly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we see happening now. And I think the polarization is going to get worse before it gets better. But I look, my hope is with the millennials. And if you look at the millennials coming out of the most conservative of backgrounds, um, they don't reject me. And boy, do their parents uh, reject me. But I, I'm very hopeful that we're going to see that shift. But of course, it's going to get ugly. It's going to be really ugly before it gets better because they're watching their power diminishing and no particular people group likes to see their power diminishing. It's not ever been about a religious belief systems on this. It's about who has the power, which tribe controls the narrative. We were talking in the in the wings just before coming out here about some of the the surprise. I mean, I think it's probably surprising to a lot of people that there is majority support among young white um, um, millennials, evangelical millennials, for same-sex marriage, and, and increasing support among even older generation evangelicals. And you were talking about some of the surprises you discovered around the same-sex marriage issue and some of the organizing you were doing. But you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that at the same time as there is increasing support for same-sex marriage among um, evangelical millennials, there is, um, it's flatline when it, over, the last, over the last two decades, there's been no movement around support for abortion. So we see trending upward, so majority support among evangelical millennials for same-sex marriage, but consistent opposition, the same levels over the last two decades for uh, abortion rights and reproductive rights. So and this is something you were seeing in some of the organizing you were doing. And so it just, I guess I'm wondering about, you know, where these sort of fault lines occur, where they fall out? Are you seeing this also falling out around any issues of racial justice? Um, and just to, like, tracking LGBT support for LGB, I'm gonna say LGB issues, doesn't always tell us about support for other issues because also trans folks have been thrown to the, you know, basically they're the new target right. in, uh, as well. So maybe sort of like, let's pull this out that, so we don't, you know, that our LGB issues sometimes being used as a kind of, um, you know, sort of false flag. Like, oh, things are going really well. Does that make sense as a question? I mean, the... Yes, yes. I, well, I think the first, the first thing to say is one of the reasons that abortion has not, from my understanding, one of the reasons that abortion has not actually gained is because whether or not people admit it, they understand it as a, an economic and a racial justice issue mm -hmm. in their heads because of how abortion has been framed so effectively as a, as a thing of the social safety net that irresponsible, mostly poor women of color take advantage of. Take advantage of in terms of services, take advantage of in terms of the state, take advantage of in terms of like the permissiveness of a white liberal secular society. And so I think it's important in this way to also take an international perspective in many ways because Latin America, another place where um, the United States has introduced a ton of austerity measures that cause racial animus among a populace, if we're talking about Brazil, if we're talking about El Salvador, if we're talking about Mexico, if we're talking about Argentina, right, places that the Catholic Church has a lot of authority, what actually happens when uh, Catholic Church authority and U.S. economic 
imperialism come together is that there may be some secular movement along what people do sexually inside their bedrooms, but there does not actually come any more support for what people to consider to be social safety net issues, right? And so austerity, austerity causes people to sort of clinch up what they think of as services that they want other people to give, other, especially people within a racial and class hierarchy that they already don't think deserve anything. You know, I don't feel as qualified to speak in this area. Um, I think I have more to learn in this area because when I look at how the evangelical population, even the younger evangelical population is responding on uh, particularly abortion, um, it does feel to me to be primarily a race issue. Mm -hmm. And it, it's... Uh, the positions that are taken are positions of privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating not seeing shifting mm -hmm. in that area mm -hmm. when, you, when you see but, but don't know how, um, how to address it in ways that are going to, how to use language that will work with that particular segment of the population. If you're talking with evangelicals about LGBT issues, um, it's narratives. We're a narrative-based species. You know, we, we, we don't sleep without dreaming and we don't dream in math mathematical equations. We dream in stories. And, and it, it, um, I even dream Freudian. I, you know, it, it's, which is very helpful when you're in analysis. Um, but uh, it's the stories that, that, are, that will shift. You know, it'll be uh, LGBTQ. You know, when your child is gay, uh, now you start questioning, wait, 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 am I going to choose a belief system that's 2,000 years old and is foggy and vague at best over the human that's standing in front of me? Mm -hmm. That brings about change. Mm -hmm. You get to the issue of um, abortion, and it, it is, there are fewer stories that can be told within that community. And so you're now starting into these rather esoteric conversations that are, um, that are not based in flesh and blood. And I think that's not helpful to the, to the process. Mm -hmm. I think, I think is, we do a fairly shitty job at it. Mm -hmm. Which is fascinating, because most people actually do know someone who has had That's an true. abortion. Oh, precisely. Right? Right. And so it, it, it makes me wonder at what point, mm -hmm. like, uh, the courage that people thought it took to talk about their abortion experiences, like, again, not an expert on this, but take a lot of inspiration from the way that the like second wave feminists mm -hmm. in the 1960s and 70s and 80s did create really wonderful conversations mm -hmm. about like um, free abortion on demand, which was the original demand, which right <laughs> for society was free abortion on demand. I think it's important to talk about like the moment at which coming out became somehow more socially acceptable than saying I have had an abortion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where I think the issue of stories is so interesting, and I think it connects to this issue of what kind of stories we can tell in public, like the coming out stories. That, you know, one of the stories that um, the Freedom to Marry movement told, and clearly very effectively, I mean, same-sex marriage is legal in every state still as of today, though there are attempts to peel it back going on across this country. But one of the stories that got told, uh, to my mind, it was a dangerous story, but this was the story that was told over and over and over again. Uh, the denial of the right to same-sex marriage denied gay men and lesbians the opportunity to show that we are as sexually responsible and as psychologically mature as those cross-sex couples who were legally allowed to marry. And I say this, this might sound like, how am I saying that, that this claim was made? I can show you documents that were made by um, people working in the same-sex marriage movement who made precisely that claim, that the denial of the right to marry was actually a consignment of um, lesbians and gay men to a perpetual immaturity. And so that the right to marry, among other things, was being posed as a sign that we have arrived, we are as responsible with our sexuality as heterosexual couples, for whom marriage is also for them a sign of sexual maturity. Now, never mind that there are any number of ways in which people can form intimacies with each other, and, and people have historically made families with each other outside of the quote-unquote heterosexual couple, right? But there was then a, this really limited in the imagination 
all sorts of other ways in which people make sexual intimacy with each other and do so with care and with responsibility. But you start framing it that way, there's very little room left over for the sexual error, sexual error, I'll put in quotes, that could lead to a young woman or an older woman um, deciding, making the decision that she needs to have an abortion. Right, because this is just an error. I mean, that's there's that was irresponsible, and it collides with these long-standing racist histories of the control over the bodies of women of color. Right, so it's just a, it's a this so basically one story that gets told around same-sex marriage collides, colludes with, I'll even say, these long-standing stories that are misogynist and racist and classist, and it's made it. I think that the same-sex marriage movement has made it much harder to articulate. Um, a politics for um, reproductive freedom in a broad way. Now, that's not the fault, I'm not, it, but I think it's, there was a, a too narrow focus. It actually, it, it unfortunately, again, I'll say colluded with these other forces, not intentionally, but um, it's made it harder to cr tell these other stories. You know, um, we're all just trying to get by, mm -hmm. you know, and we're all trying to, to, uh, to do the best we can with the tools with which we've been given to live this life. So if in fact you've had an abortion, um, you may not feel particularly called mm -hmm. to be the person to make a difference in that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're transgender, um, you're transgender every day, mm -hmm. in public every single day. Mm -hmm. If you're gay, you're gay every day, in public every single day. So I think a lot of us don't really have much choice mm -hmm in this matter. I mean, I would love to have just disappeared, mm -hmm. um, but I was way too well known in the evangelical world to be able to do that. So I recognize embedded in my identity our responsibilities. And so I'm more than happy to speak out on these issues, but I have to, mm -hmm. I absolutely have to. Someone who's had an abortion can choose to mm -hmm. or can choose mm -hmm. not to. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, uh, some of us are um, motivated out of necessity mm -hmm. and others uh, just say, you know, I don't really have the energy for that. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I might push back against that. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, well, one, right, there's the knowledge, there's the knowledge that, of, like, the history that going stealth has had in and among, like, trans and gender nonconforming people about whether, whether once we decide to change our bodies, expression, lives, lives in a certain way of whether then we can... Um, pass and, and, and it's not guaranteed, right, that we then choose to uh, join movements, speak out about ourselves, um, make our narratives public so that we can change policy, right? Um, I, would, I, would, I would also say, right, that uh, when I'm thinking about like a reproductive justice frame, um, that abortion becomes something that carries so much stigma, in fact, that it, it, it already applies to certain people before they've even had an abortion and possibly before they've even had sex, right? That's how, that's how like racialized misogyny works, you know? So people are already sexually irresponsible before they have sex and it sanctions sexual violence against them. And I think that abortion function, I think that the stigma around abortion functions in that way to maintain that sort of thing, um, that sort of structure. Um, so I, I think I'll say that. I, w I will also say that like, oh, the messaging around marriage equality was such a missed opportunity um, because there are economic justice arguments for, for marriage equality and there are like so like racial justice arguments for marriage equality, especially considering that um, a higher percentage of LGBTQ people of color are in long-term partnerships and are in fact parents than white people, which is often a function of class. <laughs> um, so I think that those those two those two things often meld, right? I would recommend for anyone who hasn't read it, there's a art, there's many articles written about this, but one of the ones that really shifted my thinking was called "How Gay Stays White and What Kind of White It Stays." Mm -hmm. It's by Alan Berry Bay, who's a labor historian, um, and he talks about the campaign for military service. Because remember, mm -hmm. before there was marriage, there was also the military, right? <laughs> we were fighting to go and murder brown and black people overseas. The M and M's, right? And that was that was like another marker of our uh, our equality uh, on a public policy scale. And he talks about the ways in which uh, very specific spokespeople were put forward 
specific kinds of messaging were decided were less important, and also certain communities were decidedly less important in terms of coalition. During the late 80s, it would actually have been unthinkable that uh, gay and lesbian people would have tried to move forward with a public policy campaign without the rest of their rainbow coalition because the rainbow coalition was the thing that had gotten them in the rooms that they were in right in the white house and why the rainbow coalition i'm talking about jesse jackson i'm talking about right dolores huerta i'm talking about all sorts of racial justice and economic justice organizers in the 1980s who included lgb or gay and lesbian as part of their platforms taking a risk for themselves obviously racial justice movement movements were not perfect in this and not and were not only not perfect but were actively homophobic and transphobic right um, but one of the things that we see then is the fracturing of that coalition around military service and marriage in the early to mid 90s because certain because the reasons that people are veterans i.e trying to get trying to go to college, trying to like avoid like all sorts of economic violence that comes from being a black and brown person in the United States are not as cute as I love my country, I just happen to be gay. Yeah. I also want to, I mean, this issue of, you know, sort of marriage equality, I mean, you know, I can certainly be, do have, I continue being highly critical of that, the narrowing of what a larger social justice movement would be like. But the truth is we have a country that organizes the conferral of 1,000 plus federal benefits and then even many more at the state level upon individuals insofar as they marry. And we can have a conversation about why certain rights, you get them when you marry. Um, and how we might actually provide other forms of social support than through marriage. But insofar as the state provides these goodies through marriage, then of course same-sex couples should be allowed to marry on an equal basis. But this might be a way also to sort of move over to this, this conversation about the ways in which religion right now, or the language of religious liberty, is being used to try to sort of peel back actually marriage equality and peel um, and sort of um, and actually in some sense deny um, LGBTQ people um, equal access to public accommodations. We saw, I mean, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case is one such example, but we're seeing other instances of, um, you know, sort of basically allowing people to claim that they have religious objections to providing service to, you know, LGBTQ people. Um, and so religion there is being brought in as a kind of trump card, a term I probably use with some deliberation, right? Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, um, is there a role that, op that people who openly identify as both queer and religious could play in shifting that use of religious liberty, right? Right now, religious liberty is being leveraged against LGBTQ people. You know, I think the place I'm gonna start is offering my organs to either Justice Kennedy or Ginsburg to make sure they stay alive for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, because that's our last point of defense mm -hmm. on this issue. The evangelical community is far better organized than they've ever been in the history of our nation. And they know how to um, energize their masses. They, I mean, the reason you have churches of 20 and 25,000 people is not because they're stupid at marketing. Uh, they, they know how to pull their people together how to speak to perceived needs, not actual needs. And since the 80s, and really Ralph Reed and his work and, and um, the moral majority and their work, they've become uh, incredibly sophisticated in the process. I work a lot with the Interfaith Alliance in Colorado, and an inordinate amount of our time right now is spent, uh, for me as uh, a religious expert, is spent testifying before committees in the state legislature because they're constantly getting these bills introduced that are in every way, shape, or form to any objective viewer, civil rights bills. That, I mean, it's just about denying rights. And at this point, I'm a little nervous. Um, I believe that the capacity to, to win in a lot of these is, um, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a slim, slim margin that we've got, and you never know where Kennedy is. Mm -hmm. Well, he was on the wrong side of the, the um, Hawaii v. Trump, right? Mm -hmm. Five to four. Yep. Um, Which, to me, I, I, that surprised me. Yeah. It, it just yeah, it just makes me... I mean, just also, just to 
clarify something as best I can that, you know, the, I, when I refer to the masterpiece cake shop case, or pe people understand that was the case having to do with whether or not a baker could refuse to sell, um, who made wedding cakes, could refuse to sell a wedding cake to a same-sex couple, claiming a religious objection to doing so. That case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The court ruled in some ways narrowly. It basically didn't yet decide whether or not he could invoke um, religious opposition as the grounds for denying a service that is a commercial service that has to be offered on equal terms, according to long-standing Supreme Court precedents. The court didn't decide that question. It basically said, before the Civil Rights Commission of the State of Colorado, he wasn't dealt with fairly. He animus against his Christian beliefs were shown. So it's on that grounds that the baker won his case. So they kind of, on the one hand, it looked like they punted. They didn't decide whether or not you can say, religion, therefore, I can, be, I can oppose equal participation in civil life to, to gay people. But it did something else. It basically has said that if a, I think, if a Christian person says there's animus against my religion, I might stand a very good chance of being able to say, therefore the state cannot do, make certain laws apply to me. And why do I say Christian? Because if you put that together with what the court decided today, when there's a strong, clear evidence of bias animus, is the legal term, against Muslims. The court held that this was neutral. It was actually about national security. So what we get, if you put these two recent rulings together, is that we do have religious freedom in this country if you're a white, straight, and Christian. And that would accord with years of Supreme Court jurisprudence, but not just Supreme Court jurisprudence. This isn't about the courts. This would accord with American history. Right? So, I mean, when I ask this question about how religious liberty is being used as a, as a lever against LGBTQ equality, I should actually make it broader. It isn't just about LGBTQ people, right? We're seeing it being used against brown people, against Muslims as well. Um, the particular way in which religious liberty is offered to some and denied to others. I, I don't know if you have some thoughts about this in terms of the organizing you've been doing and this sort of intersectional yeah, work. So back, back, back when I was working consistently on uh, campaigns, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that we were fighting again and again was this thing called RECRAs, right? Religious mm -hmm. Freedom and Restoration Acts that were being introduced nationally and on the state level um, to basically sanction uh, publicly uh, discrimination against mostly uh, transgender and gender non-conforming people, but also against um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, and also against literally anyone that you didn't want to see or interact with, right? And so I was doing, like, we were doing a messaging, like, thing, and I was like, I actually don't know any history from RIFRAs. And so the real fascinating thing is that two of the main communities mm -hmm. that advocated for religious freedom and restoration acts in the beginning were people in Native American churches, Right, who are arguing for indigenous sovereignty for their spiritual beliefs, mm -hmm. and also imprisoned like black Muslims, right, who are arguing for the ability to practice their religion inside of state incarceration institutions, right? And so how exactly does that history totally get papered over and we get now mostly white upper middle class Christians who are using RIFRAs as a way to enforce right? The, the same sort of white Christian hegemony right. that the state has, you know, always found so attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the main, like, disconnects that I found really interesting. I think, um, mm -hmm. I have to admit, I'm just straight up emotionally reeling, because, because, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm emotionally reeling. Mm -hmm. um, this entire week, two years, four years, decade life has just been like, mm -hmm one thing after the other, right? Um, and so I think when it comes to thinking about like LGBTQ Muslims and our organizing, it's like, where do I even begin in terms of like the immense amount of bigotry and, and like reasons that people don't want us to exist mm -hmm. um, and certainly don't want to see us in public, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I would, I, I think I would, I would rather talk about how the Muslim ban actually is related mm -hmm. to um, this idea of religious liberty and sexuality. Um, it's interesting that they framed it as a national security issue that is neutral, right? Because there are there are very few 
I call them meta languages, right? Things that things that we can ultimately have recourse to that will enable us to do and say whatever we want. And one of them is national security and the other is bodily security. And it just so happens that as a black Muslim, both of those result in a loss of life for people who look like me, right? Um, both of those are things that sanction uh, extraordinary violence against people all over the world who hold similar identities to me. And there's a, there's a specific reason, of, the reason for that. That is not on accident, right? Um, I think that we are very liable to talk about the ways that the Trump administration has been terrible for Muslims, but I want to be real real, real clear that actually it is the Obama administration that set the groundwork for many of the terrible racist laws that the Trump administration has been able to find public sanction for, right? Without the extension of the war on terror into West Africa and East Africa to the point where we are currently at war and bombing about seven countries, right? At least all of them majority Muslim, all of them were on the first round of the Muslim travel ban. All of them uh, had people who were being murdered day by day without any sort of trial, and the Obama administration was signing off on it day after day after day. You can't naturalize that and then be surprised when it turns into law and policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, the problems we're dealing with today are not just of today's making. I mean, the yeah. particular, the, the court um, uh, the majority in the five to four decision went back to precedents that dates the late 19th century that were used to justify the exclusion of, of, of Chinese immigrants from this country. Openly racist um, court decisions, and these were cited as precedent as still good law. So, I mean, we are, we are standing on, you know, centuries of a history of exclusion right. um, that in today's decision. So after the resistance wins and Donald Trump is, I don't know, paraded through the streets in tarred and feathered or whatever. I want us to make sure that we are continuing to show up for Muslims who are not inside of our borders already, right? Because that's what the Muslim ban is. The Muslim ban is saying the Muslims inside of our borders are a threat. The Muslims outside of our borders are especially a threat because they keep going back and forth, right? Because they don't, because Islam doesn't respect borders. And so I think it's very, very important that we're going to continue when we get a democratic president again to not be like, oh, he's not perfect. Oh, he's working on it, right? Because people are still going to be dying every day.